Hello, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now this week, uh, Facebook announced a new cryptocurrency called Libra, which it hopes to launch in the early part of 2020. Now there's lots of commentary going on at the moment about Libra, about cryptocurrencies, about the political and socio-economic impacts of cryptocurrencies. I don't want to look at that in this video. In this video, I want to look at the technology that Facebook have announced that will be the backbone of how Libra works. It's a blockchain, but it's very different to how, for example, Bitcoin works. So if you want to find out more about the technology behind Libra, and actually even at the end, I'm going to give you a demo of Libra running on their test network, which has now also been launched, then please, let me explain. So let's start with the idea of a blockchain. I do have a whole video on this, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. But put simply, a blockchain is a list of entries in a ledger, a set of records, maybe you can even consider it as a database, that is distributed across many, many nodes in a network, across computers, across the whole world. And its integrity, to make sure that it is valid and correct, can be verified by anybody by going to any one particular block and checking various things about that block and about the blocks it's related to. So the idea is with a cryptocurrency, when you perform a transaction, you add a an entry to the ledger and it says in it that Alice has sent something to Bob, some cryptocurrency, Bob has received it and their balances have been changed. And that's then put into the ledger and it's immutable, it can't be taken out, it can't be withdrawn, it can't be changed, it's there permanently. And, it, and the whole ledger is based on the fact that every other entry is linked to cryptographically using hashes to every other entry in the ledger. So if you change one, you in fact have to change the whole ledger, which is impossible to do. And Libra is based on the same idea. It's a blockchain that will be distributed across many, many nodes and that things will be added to that blockchain and that record is in itself immutable and can't be changed. Now, there are some fundamental differences though between how, let's say, Libra's blockchain works and let's say the blockchain for Bitcoin. The first is this, there are two different types of blockchains. One is a permission-based uh, blockchain and one is a permission-less blockchain. Now, in a permission-less blockchain, it means that anybody can act as a validator to add transactions to the ledger. And that's what this term mining has come from, from Bitcoin. Basically, you have to solve a puzzle that is a proof of work. And when you've done that proof of work, you then transmit it to other people and they verify that, which is very quick, much, much quicker than how long it took to calculate it. And because they verify and say, yes, that's correct, that gives the cryptographic security that then is attached to the ledger. Now, when you actually do that mining, because you've spent energy, that proof of work, you actually earn some Bitcoins. So that's how the whole Bitcoin ecosystem goes along. Now with Libra, it's actually the other system, which is permission based, which means you can only be a validator if you are let into the system by the Libra Foundation. And so to start with, they think there's maybe going to be around 100 validators, including some payment processing people like Visa and PayPal and some other big names that are going to be in there who will be able to do that validation process, not for just anybody to do. But there is a caveat to that, and that is that the Libra Foundation has said it wants to move to a permissionless based blockchain within five years. However, because it works very differently to how Bitcoin works, the technology doesn't actually exist today for that to actually happen. So it's starting with a permission based blockchain with the idea that it will migrate within the next five years. So the way a transaction works is like this. If Alice wants to send some uh, digital currency over to Bob, then Alice creates a transaction and then signs it with her private key. And then in the case of Libra, when that transaction is submitted to the network, the uh, public key, Alice's public key, is included with the transaction so that it can be verified at any moment to say that this is actually a valid transaction that has been signed by Alice. And then a validator, and in this case it's because it's permission-based, a validator from the network of approved validators that are part of the Libra Foundation will then validate that uh, transaction and ultimately it will get added to the uh, ledger. Now the problem with a distributed system is how do you verify that everybody's on the same page? How do you check that everybody agrees that this particular transaction is valid and that this particular transaction should be added uh, to permanently to the ledger? And this actually goes back to an old problem known as the uh, Byzantine uh, army, general army problem, which is basically a thought experiment about if you have 
different army generals around a city and they're going to attack it and they can only talk to each other via messenger, let's say on horseback, how do you ensure that all the armies behave in the same way, either to attack or to withdraw? Particularly if along the way a messenger can get lost, the message can get destroyed, or even worse, one of the messengers is actually a traitor and wants to send the wrong information. Now, the way that Bitcoin solves this, as I said earlier, is using this idea of proof of work. So by the fact that you have to do something that's hard and then it's very easy to verify it, everyone can be sure that the proposed solution is actually correct and that it's easily verified by everybody. The problem with the proof of work idea is that it costs a lot of money in terms of energy. In fact, we've seen nowadays that the amount of money spent on electricity for Bitcoin mining is actually the equivalent per year to what a small European country spends on its energy bill. So we don't need that kind of energy to be spent just to be able to do our banking. So Libra wants to use a different approach. So it's using a Byzantine fault tolerance system. That means it can tolerate spies, uh, malicious actors who are trying to disrupt the ledger processing, but yet still come up with the same result. And it does that very simply using a, a system known as hot stuff. And there are whole papers written about the mathematics of all of this. But basically it says this, if two thirds of the validators agree, and even up to one third disagree, the system can still go forward knowing that, they valid, that it's all been validated and the transaction is correct. So Alice wants to send the money to Bob, she signed it, it gets put into the ledger, the validators actually check it, there is a consensus that's uh, uh, given and then that then gets added to the blockchain. Now, a blockchain in the Bitcoin sense is literally a chain. So that you start at block zero and then you have block one and block two, block three, and each block is built on the cryptographic hash from the block before. So if at any point you want to change a block in the middle, then when you go to the block before, you can see that actually they don't correspond to each other. And because it's then linked to a chain, uh, down the chain to something in front, you can't take one out of the middle, you can't alter it because it affects the chains in both directions. Now the problem with that system is if you want to verify a particular block, you can verify its hash, you can maybe verify the hash of the block before it, or even the block before that, and you can say, yeah, well this looks like it's all okay, but actually to verify the entire blockchain, you need to go right back to the very beginning of when Bitcoin started and verify every single block right up to the transaction that you're doing to be 100% sure this is the correct version of the ledger. And obviously that is hard. Now, that is what we call an ON optimized problem. And I've got a whole video about big O notation, which again, I'll leave a link to in the description below. Now, what actually Libra has chosen to do is use called a Merkle tree, which rather than having all the blocks sequentially linked to each other, they are linked in a tree fashion. So two blocks have a combined hash, which goes up to the next level in the tree, then another two blocks, go up, which of course means four blocks from the level below, and then another two blocks. So very quickly you build up to a single node at the top, which has got all of the combined uh, hashing information for the whole tree. And when you want to verify any one block in a Merkle tree, that is actually O log N in terms of the uh, uh, optimization of it, which of course is much, much quicker than O N. Now, of course, all this computing that's going on is gonna take some energy. There is obviously investment need to have servers and a data center and the network connections running. So of course, with traditional banking, there are fees so that when you pay for something using a credit card or a debit card, the payment processor receives some slice of that to pay for all this infrastructure. And actually Libra is no different. There is a idea of a fee which is called gas and you pay for the gas when the part of the transaction is processed. And there's also a gas limit, which says how much you're prepared to pay for this uh, transaction to be processed. And the idea is that in moments of very heavy demand, or if the network is under attack, then of course the price of gas is gonna go up because there are less machines available to do the processing. And so you could say, well, actually I'll wait for this to be, tra to be, you know, to be done later, for the transaction to be verified later when the gas price is lower and it fluctuates up and down according to the demand. However, what the Libra Foundation says is that they expect on a normal day-to-day -day running basis, the gas fees to be very, very low. Of course, it's, it's in Libra coin itself. It's part of 
the transaction of the cryptocurrency, uh, uh, but and it'll only go up when there is something extraordinary happening. But this doesn't happen for free. All this processing has a cost attached to it. And there's one more thing to mention, and that is that the transactions inside Libra are actually done inside of a programming language called Move. It isn't just a simple case of a transaction that says, here is Alice's account, here is Bob's account, please do the transaction. There's actually a program that runs, which enables more complicated types of transactions to occur, maybe splitting it to multiple accounts, maybe waiting on some other kind of condition to occur, maybe waiting for a date or a time or something like that. And these are known as smart contracts. Now, smart contracts have been around in other cryptocurrencies and they've had some fundamental flaws in them that have resulted in actually millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency being stolen. Now, the way uh, Facebook and the Libra Foundation are talking about Move is that it comes with a kind of a security first kind of approach, which means that the common mistakes that were made in these other smart contracts are not being reproduced in Move. So the idea is that, uh, for example, they say you can never clone a digital asset, which might mean cryptographic money in this particular case. Uh, you can never clone it, even with all kinds of clever manipulation inside your program. It can never, for example, be cloned. And there are ways of verifying, the validators who run this will verify that the Move program is correct. However, there are other downsides to uh, smart contracts. If you go beyond just a simple payment from one person to another, once a contract is inside the system, it's kind of written there in concrete. And so for example, if the contract has a bug in it, a programming bug, then that bug is gonna be there forevermore. And the consequences of that bug are gonna be there forevermore. And more than that, these contracts, when you look at a move program, and I'll show one here on the screen now, a complicated one, that's a whole program that a whole programmer has to write. So now when you sign a normal contract in the real world, you need a, a lawyer to read it to make sure you're not signing away something you shouldn't be. Well, actually, smart contracts can actually do things you don't expect them to do. And suddenly more money has gone out of your account or the condition aren't met as you would expect. And so smart contracts really are really a gray area for me that they have, they do have a prop, do they have a use? I think there's more pitfalls than there are advantages to smart contracts at the moment. So let's talk briefly about the account. I've talked about Alice and Bob. We're in a Libra system. All accounts are anonymous. You need to have the private and the public key that you use to create the account. Uh, it's not associated with an email address, not associated with a physical address, although it can be in some kind of wallet system or some kind of other payment thing that's the front end to Libra, then of course you might, could associate it with your Facebook account, for example, I'm sure that's what's going to happen. But if you wanted to, you can have a completely anonymous Libra account and all you need is the public and private key to authenticate and then to sign things to get to that system. And you can have more than one, you can have a hundred of them if you want to, uh, all with their own different values of balance and so on. Now, as they've announced this system, they've also uh, already published the source code for a very basic Libra system, the Libra core. A couple of things to notice, it's written in Rust. So it's not written in C, which is what, what I would have expected has been written in Rust. And if you want a video on Rust, please do tell me in the comments below and we can look at Rust. I also fancy doing one on Golang, Google's Golang. So again, if you want that, please tell me in the comments below. Written in Rust, it's at GitHub and it's under the Apache 2 license. Now, of course, the big difference in the Apache 2 license and the GPL is that if you do a modification of an Apache 2 project, you do not force, you do not have to publish your changes back out to uh, the uh, community. You can keep them for yourself. You can keep it for a commercial enterprise. It's permissive in the sense that here it is, do what you like with it, but there's no forcefulness of making it remain free software. I'll also leave a link to the Libra GitHub and to the Move language in the description below. There's a lot of stuff in the description. I hope you are going down there to look at it to make sure you're getting all the information that I'm giving you here. Okay, so let's summarize. It is a blockchain, but it's actually a Merkle tree rather than a chain. It uses a permission-based validation, at least for the next five years. That validation is done by having a consensus across all of the different nodes that are doing the validation. Each transaction is written using the Move programming language, which is interpreted as part of the validation process. And actually it is uh, enables things like smart contracts, uh, anybody can have an account. The account doesn't have to be linked to a physical uh, passport number or email address or home address or something like that. And they hope to launch it in 2020. Okay, so now let's go over to my Linux box and we'll actually use the current 
test network that they have launched to actually do some transferring between uh, a couple of uh, Libra accounts. Okay, so here we are on my Linux machine. I have downloaded all of the uh, source code for Libra Core and compiled it and built it here on this machine. And so the first thing we're gonna do is look at the accounts that I've got. And as you can see, there's account zero and account one. And here is this is the account identifier. It's a unique number. Uh, it's not, a, not an email address, something like that. It's the unique number that will be stored in the ledger. So let's query the balance of both of these accounts to see how much money we've got. So query balance zero, we can see that it's got 200. Query balance one, and it's got 62. Now what we want to do is say, please start a transaction where I will send uh, from account zero to account one, 10 uh, Libra coins. We do that and it says that it has been submitted to a validator. Now what we can do is we can query the balance of account number one now and we can see it's 72 gone up from uh, 62 and we can also look at the account status now and here we can see that the balance is 72 but look at that it's million so that also gives us an idea of how they're going to break down libra coins into smaller parts much much smaller parts are going to be available for paying for things like the gas now what we can actually do now is we can query the blockchain for a particular set of uh, transactions so what we're going to do here is we're going to say please give me the transactions associated with account zero transaction number one we're interested in and um, here it comes back from the uh, blockchain now very quickly if we look at this here here we can see the uh, sender and we can see the uh, recipient and if we do uh, an account list uh, as we did earlier on Okay, here we can see, look at that. There is the sender, there is the recipient. These are exactly the same things as listed here. And there's other things going on in here, the amount of gas and the uh, the amount of money that was sent over and so on. So there it is, that's come out of the ledger itself. So that's it, it's just a command line tool at the moment, but that actually was using the real Libra network, the test network that they have launched uh, at the moment. And so there you have, you can see there's actually a test network, right? which means all the protocols are there, the way the system works is all defined. Now, of course, that needs to be turned from not a command line something, but actually into a seamless transaction system that you can use from, let's say, with inside of uh, Facebook. Okay, so there you have it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. It's really good if you hit that notification icon. And uh, well, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.